I want to speak to what's happened this, uh, this past week. I think you need to hear from your pastor about what happened on Friday. And I think it's important, I, I said to the 8 o'clock class, and Brian did a great job preaching at the 8 o'clock. Blessed be your name goes right along with his song this morning. What a great uh, message this morning. And so I also spoke to the 8 o'clock service about just this issue that the Supreme Court, what they decided on Friday. And so I think you need to hear from your pastor, and you need, we need to just to declare as a church. Uh, this past Friday, you know that the Supreme Court declared that same-sex marriage is legal in all 50 states. If you have not realized, America is different landscape than what America our grandparents lived in. Amen? I mean, it's a little bit la a different landscape. But here's what I want you to know. We still serve the same God that our grandparents served. God has not changed. Uh, America looks a little different and things have changed. But I just want you to understand today that it is God who instituted marriage. And God is the one who said that it is the union between one man and one woman. That has not changed. Just because a court of men and women have decided to say that it is legal doesn't make it moral. Okay? So we need to stay and stand on our conviction that we stand with God's word. Our young people and our children learned this week about Daniel and about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And when Daniel was told not to pray, he threw open his shutters and he prayed anyway. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, you're supposed to bow to this golden image, they would not bow. What I want to say as your pastor is that Ridgeview Baptist Church, we will stand with all other churches of all denominations who do not bow to a king or a court decision or political correctness, we will honor the sanctity of marriage. Amen? Amen. That it is one man. Amen. That's right. We declare it as one man and one woman, and we will not waver on our conviction. I speak as your pastor, and on behalf of your youth pastor, we will not marry same-sex couples. It doesn't matter whether the courts say it's legal or not. And our church will not have same-sex ceremonies in it. And so I just want to speak as plain as I can. I hope you understand what I've said. Let's try to speak as plain as I can that we will honor God's Word. And just because it's legal, young people, doesn't mean it's moral. And so our scripture today is going along with that. But let me just say on the other side of this, we need to be a people who are filled with love. We need to be a people who remember what Ephesians 4.15 says, and it's been our theme, speak the truth in love. We need to be a people who are not drawn in to being a people who are judging and mean-spirited and name-calling, because we need to be a people who recognizes those people who are caught in this bondage and this, 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 this burden of homosexuality are people that Jesus loves. Amen? And that Jesus came to die for. The same people that we are, many people are labeling and saying such harsh and mean things about, that's the people Jesus came to die for. So we are to be a people who are, don't allow this court's decision to cause us to be drawn into social media. There's a trap that's being set for believers. And we need to be careful that we don't get caught up in it and all of this, this, this mean-spirited things, we need to be a people who stand on our conviction and we speak the truth and we say, yes, our church will not marry same-sex people. We're not going to marry, do same-sex marriages. That's our conviction. But we love all people. Those who are homosexuals, Jesus loves you, and we want to love you with the love of Christ. And, and we want to stand on our convictions, but we don't want to drive away the people that Jesus came to save. So don't get caught up in the trap. In your break room at work, don't get caught up in these, these stupid, downgrading jokes. You stand up for what your conviction is. Yes, this is wrong and it's sin, and our church will not, will not participate. But I am not going to be drawn into this trap on social media and in the break room and at school. I'm going to show some respect, and I'm going to show some integrity. Amen? So this is what we need to recognize. We must speak the truth in love. I want us to pray together before we look into our passage. Heavenly Father, we love you. And we know that 
our country is on a slippery slope. And we know that our, our country and our leaders are leading us far away from you and your word. As we're going to be reminded in your word today, you call us to be salt of the earth. You call us to be the, the moral compass. You call us to be the ones who speaks conviction, who, who speaks the truth. And, but Lord, help us that we will not, not be drawn into this holier than now, this judging, critical spirit, mean, but help us to do it in love. As Colossians says, let our grace, let our, let our speech be with grace, seasoned with salt. Lord, help us to be a people who love those who are captive in these strongholds of homosexuality. You love those people. And those people, we want to invite them to come here and to hear the truth and to hear the gospel. And we want to love them with your love. And we want to be friends to them and stand in our conviction. But help us to be a people of compassion. Help us to be a people not to see them as our enemies, but as people who need the gospel. People who who need to be set free. So help us to be that type of people. Lord, we pray for our nation, we pray for our leaders, that there would be a repentance. Lord, help us as churches that we would stand for our conviction no matter the cost. Lord, we thank you for a chance to study your word. We pray your Holy Spirit will become our teacher. We pray for for Roy in the hospital. We pray for Sharon's dad. We pray for Janet. So many others who are hurting that you administer them. Teach us, for we are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we read in Mark. Now turn over to Matthew chapter 5. I want to read the same, similar passage out of the Beatitudes. Mark chapter 5, verse 13. Today's message is very appropriate for the landscape. We've been doing a series of messages on the questions that God asks. And one of the questions that Jesus asks is in Mark and in Matthew, and he's going to ask the question, if salt loses its flavor, how will it be seasoned? How how can it be any good? And he's going to tell us in verse 13 here of Matthew 5, he says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? There's the question. Is it then good for nothing but to thrown out, be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men? You can go on and read about the light, but notice in verse 16 he says, Let your light so shine before men. I think also the understanding is be salt also, so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus asked his disciples to be salt of the earth. In, in fact, he commands them, You are the salt of the earth. Now, the you here is plural. So he's not just talking to these disciples, but he's talking to all followers of Jesus. He's talking to churches today, and he says to us, We are to be the salt of the earth. The understanding there is one grain of salt. It's not going to flavor much. But if you have a whole bunch of grains of salt working together, then it's going to flavor this world. And so we're to work together. You need to work together alongside other brothers and sisters at work and in your community and and other churches. We need to bond together to support each other as we stand on issues just like before us. We need to encourage One another. So the you there is plural. Also, we see the you there seems to have the understandable emphatic in the sense that you alone, only you, you're you're the hope for the world. You're the only one that's going to speak truth. You see, as we are salt of the earth, Jesus is calling us to influence the world. You're to be an influence to this world. I need you. You're important. That's one of the reasons he chose salt to be the example, because salt was very valuable in Jesus' time. In fact, the Ethiopians would use bars of salt as currency. If you've ever heard the old saying somebody might say about somebody, you're not worth your salt. You ever heard that? Okay, that's where that comes from, because salt was valuable of resource, and Jesus is saying to us, you are valuable, because you alone, not only do you speak truth, and there's lots of people who are speaking truth, but you speak truth with hope. You speak truth with the gospel, and you have something to offer the world. And so he says to us, I want you to be salt of the earth. And he's encouraging us that it's important that we do that, because just like salt, we are valuable. You notice he says in verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. MacArthur in his commentary was talking about that word are means being. It's not doing, it's being. 
He says to us, it should become your lifestyle, that this should be how you live, that it's not just I'm salt on Sunday morning, but no, I'm salt every day of the week. I'm salt on Monday when I go back to work. I'm salt in my community. I'm salt at my school. It's who I am. It's my being. It's my lifestyle. I'm going to knock this dog thing off. I'm going to move it. All right, so we need to be solved. The R there is about being. We're valuable, and it should become our lifestyle. It's not just about doing. Us as as church people are good about doing things. Doing a project, doing a project, a, a Bible study, doing, doing. Jesus says, you're to be being. Being salt. Where you've been placed to be salt and to tell others about the gospel. So he says to us, you are valuable. See, I think Jesus wants us to understand every one of us are valuable. Our young people are valuable. Our our adults are valuable. Our senior adults are valuable. You have influence on some people that Jesus says, I need you to be salt. I need you to be an influence and that group of people that I've placed around you. So each believer, follower of Jesus is valuable like salt and to be an influence in this world. Now, experts say there are 14,000 uses for salt. For time's sake, we're just going to talk about four, okay? Because if we did 14,000, we'd be here next week. So I want to talk about four things very briefly that relates to what salt use is and how it can be related to us as the followers of Christ. And so we're going to move quickly, so you hang on, because we're going to get through this. First of all, salt adds flavor. Anthony's a cook, a good cook, and he's here. And I, I heard on the radio just a couple of days ago, this professional chef was, was talking on sports radio I was listening to. And they asked him the question, what, what is it that, what's the mistake that most cooks at home make? And this guy, professional chef, says one of the mistakes they make is they don't use enough salt in their cooking. Now, if you've if you got high blood pressure, don't go home and say, preacher said I could eat all the salt I wanted. That's not what I said. Don't go tell your doctor that because it don't matter. I'm just saying when you're cooking, he says you ought to use a little bit more salt than you do because here's what he said. Salt will take the molecules of the food and what salt does to those certain molecules, it will cause it the flavor to be released in the air. And you can, a lot of the scent that you smell from food comes from the salt. It will make those molecules to release the aroma of the food into the air. Without salt... Many foods are flavorless and tasteless. I mean, you got your list of things. Tomato sandwich, light bread, tomatoes, mayonnaise, and salt. I mean, you got to have salt. Cucumbers, you got to have salt. Watermelons, you got to have salt. Green beans don't taste like anything until you cover them in salt. I mean, there's some things, you know, you got to have salt to give it flavor and to give it taste. And our lives should be that way. We should be the flavor of Jesus in this world. Our lives should release a sweet aroma out into the places where we live, to the school we attend, the workplace where we're at. It should release just a sweet aroma. Look in 2 Corinthians. There's a great verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Verses 14 and 15. And we're going to come back and just hold your hand there because we're going to come back to verse 16. It says in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. And through us, listen to what he says, diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. The places that we go, we should be diffusing the fragrance of Christ. When I walk into a room, I ought to be like salt, and I release the fragrance of Jesus When I go to the school, to that high school down at Volunteer or Gate City or DB, when I go to the middle school, when I go to the college, when I go into that classroom, I should release the sweet aroma of Jesus. He says, diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. When when we get drawn into conversations about this issue about same-sex marriage, we need to diffuse the fragrance of his knowledge. Do it with grace, Colossians says. Season with salt. Just be a wonderful flavor. Here's my conviction. But you know God loves you. Your sin's no worse than my sin. It's sin. And God can change your life. Oh, we need to be a people who are 
uh, just putting out the fragrance of Christ. Look what it says in verse 15. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. We are to be a people who are, are just releasing the sweet aroma of Jesus. When you go into a room or when you leave, leave a room, are you leaving behind the sweet aroma of Jesus? When you leave that break room, do some of them guys in there say, in their heart, you know there's something different about him? Jen had to grow up around three males, me and the two boys. And you moms that have boys, you know that boys have their own smell to themselves, don't they? I mean, especially teenage boys, nothing personal here, guys. It's just how we're made. And so Jen's learned to that us boys just have smells to ourselves, you know. And, and so Jen, I used to wonder, why did she light all those candles, you know? <laughs> why is all those candles in the house, you know? And I figured it out. She's trying to, to get rid of that male smell, you know. I come in from working outside about two weeks ago, and I was sitting there in the recliner. I said, Jen, something smells in here. I don't know what it is. She come in and started smelling. It was me. I was the one that was stinking. I'd been all sweaty and dirty, and I thought it was something else. So we can even think about, we live in a world of death. We live in a world of deceit, of depression, of defeat. We need to be salt of this earth and we need to be an aroma of life and hope and joy and peace because Jesus lives in us and the gospel's living out of us and this flavor comes out into this world and he says, I need you to be a fragrance of Jesus in this world. Does your life give off an aroma of Christ. Second thing, real quickly, is that salt causes thirst. A lot of people take salt pills, so they'll drink more water and help with, with, with all different things. And if you eat something salty, it causes you to want to be thirsty. Same thing with our life. Our life should cause others to want what we have. You ever went into a restaurant and you, you saw what someone else was eating, you smelt what someone else was eating, and you said, hey, I just want what that guy's got. I, I just want what he has. Just give me that. That's the way it is with us. Our, our life, we're like salt. And when we're around people, it should cause people to want to thirst. I, I want what you got. I want that hope you got. I want that joy you got. I want that peace. I want what you got. I, I mean, there's a thirst. I mean, Brian talked about the early service that we should thirst for God. Our lives should cause others to want to thirst for God. It should cause other believers, maybe who've wandered away from God. Our lives should encourage them and they'll get to thirsting for God again. Our lives to the lost should be drawing them. We should be life to them. Here it says a fragrance of Christ. Our lives should draw them to Jesus. Our marriages should be the example of a marriage. That other people look at our marriage and they say, I want a marriage where Jesus is Lord, like their marriage. Young people at school and at college, you live a life and people look at your life and they say, I want a life like, like they got. It should cause thirst in other people's lives. Our lives should cause a thirst for the living water. Can you say amen? A thirst for Jesus. Third thing, and very quickly, salt stings a wound. If you're still in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, look at verse 16. He says, To the one we are the aroma of death, leading to death, and to the other the aroma of life, leading to life. And who is sufficient? For these things. We're to be flavor. We're to bring flavor to this world. We're to cause people to thirst and want God. But I'm telling you, as you live your life for Jesus, this is the part most of us don't like. But when you live for Jesus, you're going to rub some people wrong. It's salt, when you get, you ever had a cut in your hand or your arm or something and you get sweaty or, or you, you know, you get salt, and you're eating watermelon or something, get salt in that cut, man, it burns. It hurts. It stings. As we live for Jesus at the workplace, at the school, in our family, in our community, some people are going to get thirsty for Jesus, and they're going to come and get saved. And they're going to come, and we're going to be life to them. We're going to be an aroma of life, and we're going to, we're going to lead them to Christ. And then some people, they're going to resist us, and they're going to persecute us. And they're going to turn against us. Jesus ended up on a cross. Don't forget. Our lives will not only cause people to thirst, but will cause others to curse. 
It will cause them to turn away from God, to turn away from us. They will despise us. They will not want to be around us. There is a cost. In fact, I think this court decision on Friday is going to become a litmus test for some people at your work. And I think some people with your family. And I think for you to stand up for Jesus, stand up for your conviction, some of you it's going to cost you some friends. Some of it's going to cost you some invites to this and a promotion here. I'm just telling you, some of the people, when we, when we stand up for Jesus, our fragrance, death. Because we're showing them their sin. And we're showing them hell. And we're saying to them, you need Jesus. And some people's going to be offended. You do recognize that, right? I mean, you do recognize just the preaching I'm doing today, there's going to be some people who's not going to have much to say about our church good. They're going to be offended because what we're saying of the Word of God. And so just know, salt causes thirst, but it also burns that cut. But here's the thing, we can't stop speaking the truth just because we offend somebody. Can you say amen? Speak the truth in love. Even though you may cause some stinging, we must be salt. Because those, think about a wound, those Jesus died for, they're wounded people. And our, our gospel may wound them and sting them, but we're praying the Holy Spirit will bring them to a place of salvation. Last of all, real quickly, salt is a preserving influence. Salt was used by the Egyptians to preserve mummies. We use it to preserve food, pies, jams, meat. So we look at our role in this world. Our world is decaying. Our world is rottening away. And it would be going a whole lot faster if it wasn't for the followers of Christ. Think about when the rapture happens and the church is raptured out. It's only going to take seven years for the world to go to hell in a handbasket. Seven years, and it's going to be completely wiped away because evil will be released. So he calls us to be salt in this world, to be the conscience of this world, to be the moral compass. We are to be the preserving truth because we're the only ones that's going to stand up for the truth. We're the only ones. If you're waiting for the media to do it, good luck. If you're waiting for the White House to do it, good luck. We're the ones, the followers of Christ, we're the ones called, we're the ones preserving truth, we're the ones to speak up as salt, we're the ones that have to speak our conviction of this is what God's Word says. For young people, the Bible is our compass. This is how we live our life. This is the compass. We don't live our life based on political opinion. We don't live our life based on the laws of this land. We don't live our life based on what other people think. We live our life on the Word of God. Amen, church? Amen. It's our compass. This tells us marriage is a union of one man and one woman. This tells us abortion is murdering precious little babies. This tells us lying is sin. This tells us Living together outside of marriage is sin. This tells us sex before marriage is sin. This tells us homosexuality is sin. This is the compass. I don't care what the Supreme Court says. I don't care what, what all other anybody else says. We have to live our life by this compass. And then Jesus says to us, okay, this is your compass. Now, you're to be the moral compass for this world. You're to be the, the conscience for the world. You're, you're to be the moral compass, to be the ones to stand and say, this is what God's Word says. Jesus says, you're salt. And your important influence for this world. We have to be the voice of truth, speaking truth in love. Salt gives flavor. Salt causes thirst. Salt perseveres. Salt causes stinging and wounds. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. And then he asked the question, what if salt loses its flavor? What would happen is they would gather the salt up out of the, out of the Dead Sea and some of the salt would have some minerals in it. It would look like salt. They would take it to their home and they'd begin to eat it and the taste was awful. That, that salt's lost its flavor. It's been contaminated, contaminated with, with some minerals so they would throw it out. Now they wouldn't throw it on the grass because it would kill the grass. So they'd throw it out on the path and that salt would dissolve into the dirt and never be noticed. Jesus says about us, 
if you are contaminated by sin and by worldliness, then you become really useless. Now, it's not an issue of your salvation. We're not saying you lose your salvation, but you come useless. You have no influence. You're salt that has no flavor. You're salt that has no saltiness. And, and so you're useless. And, and, and you're, not, you're not being able to use by the chef. And you're not being able to use by God to do the things that He desires in your life. And so today, if you've been contaminated, if, if there's some sin in your life and worldliness in your life, then, then the invitation is an opportunity to come to this altar and say, God, I want to be salt God, may the Holy Spirit remove all these things that's contaminated me and forgive me of these sins and help me to, to live a life that's holy and true and Christ-like. For those who are lost today, Jesus has put some godly people in your life to give you a thirst. The Holy Spirit's been drawing you that you would have a thirst. And now it comes, what will you do? Will you put your faith in Jesus and ask Him to save you? When you have a good meal, do you pick up that salt shaker and you say, thank you, Mr. Salt Shaker, that was a wonderful meal. Does anybody ever do that? When you get lunch today and you're sitting there at the lunch table, you pick up that little Morton salt pack, that was such a wonderful meal. Thank you so much. Is that what you do? No, you say, hey, will you tell the chef, Jen fixed supper one day this week. It's been a crazy week. And so she fixed supper. And I said, that was a wonderful supper. Honey. Thank you for that. It was great. I didn't say to the salt shaker, man, you did really good. No, I said to the chef. Matthew 5, verse 15 there said, We're salt and we're light, so the Father in heaven be glorified. We're to be salt in this world. Not so we'll get recognized, not so we'll get a pat on the back, not so we'll say, man, you're doing good. No, we're just to put ourselves that we would be an ingredient in the hands of the greatest chef. And he could take us and he could spread us where he wants us. He could put us in this pot. He could put us on this dish. He could put us in this neighborhood. He could put us at this workshop. He could put us at this school. He says, if you'll be useful and you'll live for me, I can accomplish great things in your life. Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth. If there's ever a time when this world needs some salt, it's now. Can you say amen? Would you, as men and women of faith, and maybe you've wandered away, maybe you need to come and get things right, maybe here and you're lost, we pray you'd come and be saved. Stand with me for prayer. Lord, we love you. We thank you for giving us the opportunity to be part of your mission. Thank you that we can be part of taking the gospel to other people. Lord, thank you that you called us to be salt of this earth. Lord, forgive us when we get contaminated by sin and worldliness. We don't want to be useless. We don't want to be thrown out, thrown out and just dissolve into this world and have no impact. We want to have influence. So may you work in our lives. And Lord, if there's some needs in your people today, some, some of your followers that's just lost their flavor, lost their, their saltiness, they, they need to just come and Come to the feet of Jesus. And Jesus, you're ready to forgive them and clean them up and, and use them again. So thank you for what you're going to do. We give you praise and glory for you are worthy. We pray in Jesus' name. Just keep your heads bowed.